ठीक So, um, yeah, so Greek was the language of the empire, like English is throughout the world right now. And so most of the uh, gospels were spread in the Greek language. Now, we know that Jesus talked to his apostles and disciples in the local area in Aramaic, but uh, that was pretty much just a regional uh, language. And so even though he taught and spoke in Aramaic, uh, everything else was spread out in Greek. And by the way, there is evidence that Jesus actually probably knew Greek and communicated in Greek, especially when he was talking to Gentiles, like the centurion when he uh, healed his servant and other uh, Gentiles that he spoke with that were outside of the Hebrew community. So there's good evidence that Jesus actually spoke and used both languages. Now the Greek term evangelion literally means good news and is used in relation to the message that Jesus brought and that was documented by his disciples. Yet each gospel is headed by the name of a concrete author. And so, for instance, in the original Greek, uh, those headings were the gospel according to Matthew, according to Mark, according to Luke, and according to John. And so these were uh, the good news uh, that each of the four authors uh, presented, but the good news not of, of the, the, sorry, it was the good news of Jesus Christ according to the version or exposition of one of the four evangelists. It's the same good news, but in different uh, authors. And this morning, when we go into the divine liturgy, you'll hear the deacon announcing the gospel as the reading of the holy gospel according to Saint. And in, in the time of year that we are right now, it's the gospel of Saint Luke. Uh, each gospel version has a a season in our church. If we begin with Pascha, from Pascha to Pentecost, it's the Gospel of John, St. John. And there's a reason for that. It's because brand new Christians were now uh, entering the church and they heard the words that we hear on Pascha. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, etc. And so these uh, Christians who were uh, catechized prior to Pascha on uh, during Lent uh, heard the Gospel of John. Following that, we have the Gospel of Matthew, which starts from Pentecost and goes to just about where we are now in the calendar, uh, usually late summer, early fall. We are now in the in the season of Luke. And so you'll hear the Gospel of Luke from now about to just before um, Lent. And from Lent, during the Lenten season, it's the Gospel of Mark. And so all four Gospels, sections from them are read during the church year. And they're appropriate to where we are uh, in the church calendar. So from, uh, if we go by modern scholarship, most modern scholars think that the Gospel of Mark was the first Gospel written. Uh, and it's noted that it contains a portrait of Jesus that is known to the other two synoptic evangelists, Matthew and Luke. Uh, again, there's question about whether that's correct or not. And you'll see in a, in a moment that um, it really doesn't matter. But for historical purposes, let's say the Gospel of Mark was the first Gospel. Then following that, Matthew and Luke added to the portrait in accordance with the aim of the narrative, taking into account the interests of the supposed reader. Uh, the Gospel of Mark is the shortest of all the Gospels. 
uh, Matthew and Luke had add a little more uh, detail uh, to Mark's gospel. And again, as we said, Matthew wrote for the Jewish Christians. Uh, Luke and uh, Mark were actually uh, directing their gospels toward the Gentile Christian community. And then finally, John raises the gospel narrative, as we said, to another loftier theological level. And the aim of that gospel was the whole Christian community throughout the world. And yet all four narratives remain one gospel in four forms. And the portrait of Jesus is not transformed into portraits of four different persons. And so let's remember, it's a very uh, important to look at the gospels that they're describing the same person, but four different narratives. And St. Gregory, the theologian, has this to say. He says, Matthew really did write the miraculous works of Christ for the Hebrews in Aramaic, but it's come down to us in Greek. Mark wrote for the Italian Christians, Luke for the Greek, and John, the great preacher, according to, uh, ascending to heaven for all. Yes, Greg. Yeah, the first gospel was probably around the year 60, 65. And if we look at the, the death and resurrection as around the year 30, 35, then. Yeah, yeah, some, some of them were. That's a good question. And, and the reason is, is because oral tradition transmission was the norm at that time. Uh, written uh, transmission was pretty limited uh, because literacy, written literacy was, was limited as well. And so the most common way to transmit the, the teachings and the life of Christ was word of mouth. What happened was when Matthew was getting ready to leave his community, to go, the Hebrew community within Palestine to go and, and minister or missionary missions, his community uh, asked him to leave a written memorial of the life of Christ so that they could have that concrete written uh, source to refer to. And I think, as we'll see here shortly, uh, Mark and Luke both had the same kind of situation as well. Sure. So the earliest information regarding uh, the origin of these gospels uh, is addressed by St. Irenaeus of Leon in the fourth and the second century. And he says, as we've said, Matthew issued his written gospel among the Hebrews in their own dialect while Peter and Paul were preaching at Rome and laying the foundation of the church. So that's another reason, Greg, that Paul and Peter were still preaching it orally to different communities within the Roman Empire, within the Roman world. And I, as I said, so when Matthew was getting ready to go out and preach in other areas, he wrote his gospel then. But Peter and Paul are still preaching it orally, actively. After their departure, after actually Peter and Paul were martyred in Rome, then Mark, the disciple and interpreter of Peter, uh, also handed down his gospel uh, in writing uh, and that as he learned it from Peter himself. Luke also, the companion of Paul, recorded in a book, the gospel preached by Paul. So you see what's happening here. Luke is following Paul in his missionary journeys. And he's, Luke is a physician, so he's well uh, skilled in writing. And so he's writing down things that St. Paul has preached. And as we know, uh, Luke wrote both his gospel and the book of Acts of the Apostles. So it's almost like a continuum from the life of Christ in his teaching and now into the preaching of Paul and Peter somewhat into 
the uh, communities in the Gentile communities. And that's around uh, the year AD 70. Now these are approximate uh, times. I should go back. Uh, we're saying here, Matthew looks like around 65 AD, uh, Mark around 68, Luke around AD 70, and then finally, uh, afterwards, John, the disciple uh, of the Lord who leaned upon his breast, did himself publish a gospel during the, his residence in Ephesus in Asia around 95 AD. So by the end of the first century, all four gospels had been written. Now, according to St. Clement of Alexandria, who was uh, a bishop in uh, Alexandria in the second century, uh, the Gospels of Matthew and Luke were written first, followed by Mark and then John. So there was some um, discrepancy as to which Gospel was written first and second and third, etc. This was resolved uh, around the end of the, uh, sorry, the beginning of the fourth century, the three hundreds, in both the Eastern churches and in the Roman West. Uh, the notion that the Gospels were combi compiled in the order in which they were placed in the New Testament. So Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It was decided that's how they were written. That's what we're going to go with. So in the tradition of the church, Matthew and John are considered among the 12 apostles, as we know from the uh, written accounts, while Mark and Luke are among the 70 apostles. And we know that um, in addition to the 12 disciples and apostles, 70 others were also uh, appointed by the church uh, for both uh, the preaching of the word and uh, also service to the church. So Mark and Luke are among the uh, 70. Now, over the centuries, the Gospels were an object of great reverence in the church, and even the number of evangelists was considered to be sacred. And you know that during our divine liturgy, we see in the little entrance, uh, the gospel being brought out from the sanctuary into the nave and then processed into the church. And that is because the gospel is now a symbol in written form of Jesus Christ. The book that's brought out is not the whole Bible, it's not even the whole New Testament, but it is literally Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And we see it in this icon, and we'll see it during the Divine Liturgy. It's usually encased in metal, and the, the icon on it, a little bit hard to see, but in the center is usually the icon of Christ crucified, and then these are the four evangelists uh, in little medallions on the corners. On the back of the uh, uh, gospel book is the same thing, same arrangement, but it's the resurrected Christ in the center and then the four evangelists around it. You notice here the deacon is holding the gospel book. One hand is hidden under his stole. And that is a sign of reverence for literally holding Christ in his hand. And we see it in icons sometimes that the uh, angels have their hands hidden under their gowns, so to speak. Again, as a sign of reverence to Christ, who is their God and master. And so the you'll see the deacon today when he comes out processing with the uh, gospel book, he'll hold one hand under his stole in a sign of reverence for what he's holding in his hands. And another thing is the four evangelists were compared to the four corners of the earth, and their portrayals were found in the pendentives of the closed dome churches, sorry, the cross dome churches, uh, each wall of which was situated toward one of the four parts of the world east, west, north, and south. And when you go into our church nave today, you'll see uh, in the pendentives under the dome, 
uh, Matthew and John facing east there in the front. They have reverence for them because they're the oldest. And Mark and Luke are behind us if you're facing east. And so all four going out to all four corners of the world. Essentially, they're preaching the gospel to the whole world. So the writings of the four evangelists have been interpreted many times by the church fathers. And as a matter of fact, for at least 1,100 years during the Byzantine Empire, and more than 1,500 years in the Western church, and for more than 900 years in Russia, the Gospels were the most quoted sources, and the number of citations from them could not be compared to any other work of literature. This was when the world, the Eastern Christian world and the Western Christian world, were predominantly Christian. And you notice most of this ended around the 19th century. This around the 19th century is when humanism and more secularism started to come into the uh, Eastern and Western culture. And that's when citations of the gospels started to decrease. But for many centuries, Christianity and the Christian gospels were what you heard when you heard someone citing literature. Any questions up to this point? Pretty straightforward, I think. So what's the role of oral tradition in all this? We talked about you know, how in the early stages of the church tradition, uh, the, the, uh, everything was passed on by word of mouth because that was the normal culture at that time. Uh, this culture, the most natural means of spreading the, uh, the, the information uh, was mouth to mouth. And we're not talking about gossip here, like, hey, did you hear? No, no this is actually people who were memorizing and learning what they had heard. An important role in all of this was played by memory. Since in order to transmit a particular tradition, it was necessary to commit uh, to memory that which they wanted to transmit. <clears throat> and so we have to consider two concepts here, professional memory and collective memory. Professional memory is the ability of a person of a particular profession to retain in his memory or her memory a huge volume of material that may seem unrealistic to a person of a different profession. So anybody here had to le learn a lot of and memorize? I'm sure Dr. Sam, Kyle, anyone else? It's a huge volume. I mean, it, it's almost impossible. And yet people do it. Exactly. Very good point, Tony. This is the other thing about professional memory. There's a saying, use it or lose it. If you don't, and you have to almost continually repeat and review uh, what you've learned over and over again to literally burn it into your memory. And so, as you said, with these epic poems in the past, and now with what we're talking about with Jesus' teachings in particular, his sayings and his teachings, these things were memorized as though they were a professional that was trying to learn the material that they were presented with. In addition to that, there's a collective memory, uh, which also has a specific nature. If the participants of an event or a series of events are a group of people, then when one person reproduces these events, the other participants can easily correct them if there are any errors in the narrative. And so if everyone is seeing and hearing the same event, somebody goes down, comes to write it down, and they make a mistake, it's usually pretty easy to, to find out that mistake and to correct it. 
And these are not simply a group of incidental witnesses, for instance, just a, a group of people who witnessed, let's say, a, a car accident, and they're all asked to give their account of what they saw. They may see different things at different uh, angles and may have different accounts. But if you have a circle of like-minded people united by common interests and a common type of thinking, the probability of erroneous transmission of information about the events is almost nil uh, when other uh, members of the group uh, were participants in the event. So if everybody is there for a particular reason and looking at this event and listening and trying to uh, understand it all together, then that also helps in the collective memory as well. So the traditions about Jesus were preserved within a single group of his disciples and followers. Don't forget the core group of disciples followed him everywhere he went and saw every miracle, heard every uh, sermon. And by the way, the Sermon on the Mount and things like that that we hear, we have seen written, uh, there you weren't necessarily only spoken at one time. He may have spoken these things several times, many times throughout his, uh, mostly through Galilee, uh, every now and then into Judea. But so they're hearing these things uh, more than once as well. Uh, these traditions were fixed both in the memory of separate witnesses and in the memory of the entire community. So individually and all as a group, they remembered these things. At the same time, many traditions had verbally fixed element. This relates in the first place to the speeches of Jesus, which are transmitted from mouth to mouth and word for word in the same way as today's people convey uh, poetic verse to one another. And as Tony mentioned earlier, even the epic poems of the uh, ancient secular writers. So people learn these things so that they could transmit them uh, word for word. The parables, his teachings, even the long ones, such as the Sermon on the Mount, for a long time could only exist in the form of oral traditions, but this had no impediment in the way they were reproduced. They were so accurately reproduced that it was really as efficient as we do nowadays in our electronic means of transmission. There was, in fact, the, the author here says memory, even more so collective memory, was in its own way no less a reliable means of retaining information as modern day electronic means. So just because they have computers and uh, you know, television doesn't mean we're any more accurate than they were. So did the apostles have professional memory? That's the question that the author asks. As we know, many of them were fishermen. They were not necessarily quite literal, literate men. However, being continually alongside Jesus, the opportunity to see what he did and to hear many times what he said made them professionals in the cause for which they had chosen. Uh, he had chosen them. So even though they weren't literate, they had the ability to learn just as well as any of us could learn if we were focused on that enough. So in his lifetime, in Christ's lifetime, during his lifetime, the disciples knew that they were to convey to the world the word that they had heard from him. And after his death and resurrection, this word acquired for them completely special meaning and significance. What was that? He, Christ literally said to them, go and make disciples of all nations. So he gave them this command. And now it wasn't just a matter of, I'm going to tell you a story. No, I'm going to make you a disciple of this man, Jesus Christ. And so they had that in their memory. Now, these stories have come down to us in the retelling of several witnesses, uh, which could differ in details, uh, 
And that is why sometimes we'll have four different, uh, three different versions, usually of the synoptic gospels of the same event. At the same time, in practically all instances, the most important principle was preserved, which has allowed the church not to merge all four gospels into one. There may have been the, the uh, tendency to want to put all four gospels together. Let's just, you know, have one uh, version and correct all the uh, variations. Not necessarily. There were good. There was good reason to keep all four versions uh, separate because each version had something to add to the narrative. Even though there were minor variations, in most part they were somewhat insignificant as long as the principle was preserved. So the principle is very simple. While differing between themselves in detail, the evangelists were never at variance in the essence of the story. For instance, we have the story of the feeding of the 5,000 with the five loaves and two fishes. And so the evangelists differ between themselves in the identification of the location where this happened. Uh, there's differences in the dialogues between Jesus and his disciples while this was going on. And there are details that uh, are different uh, between one evangelist in their absent in some uh, versions, but present in others. However, the basic elements of the miracle in the four evan in the four evangelists coincide. The miracle occurs in the evening. We know this is later in the day because the disciples are worried. You got five thousand people here. We've got to feed them. How is this going to happen? And it's late in the day, Jesus. You know what are we going to do? So they all agree to that. They all agree that there's five loaves. There are two fish, and there's at least five thousand men and women not including women, men, women, I'm sorry, women and children. So these details are consistent and that was, that's the real essence. And the sequence of events is also the same. They bring the five loaves and two fish to Christ. Usually that some of the accounts of a young child brings them. Nonetheless, same thing, five loaves, two fish. Jesus takes them, gives thanks, blesses them, distributes them to the apostles. The apostles then distribute them to the people. And the apostles then collect 12 basketfuls of leftovers. These are the consistent essential elements of the miracle of the five loaves and two fish. And those are preserved in all four gospels. So Pivoras is a typical instance of one and the same story told by four people of whom two were probably witnesses, Matthew and John. Were literally ones that were distributing the, uh, the food to the people and gathering everything up afterwards. And the other two, Mark and Luke, wrote down their accounts from what they'd heard from the literal witnesses. So while differing in the details, all four narrators come together in the essence of what actually happened. And let us not forget the role of the Holy Spirit in all of this. Remember what Christ said to his disciples when he said, I will send you the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, who among other things will bring into your remembrance all these things that I have said and done. And then and we see in this, in this icon here, this is St. Mark writing his gospel, and we see an angelic figure sort of telling him maybe some details he did not remember. So we have to remember that the Holy Spirit, just like he spoke through the prophets in the Old Testament, now also helps in the New Testament. He's what? The He's the editor. <laughs> I'm sure he looked over the, the uh, manuscript and said, you know, I, I would make a few changes here. <laughs> but yes, we have to understand the Holy Spirit is leading us into all truths, as Christ said. 
And then I'm just going to wrap up here with the essence of the Gospels. In other words, we have all these narratives. We have all this information. What's the real take-home message? And so and if, if you take home nothing else today, remember this. The Apostle Paul, in the middle of the first century, laid out the entire essence of the Gospels in the following concise memorandum address to the Christians in Corinth. And he says to them, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you. Remember, gospel means good news. So he's not talking about the written Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but he's talking about the good news that I'm giving you and all the other apostles have been giving uh, people throughout the world which I uh, preach unto you, which I, uh, which you also have received and wherein you stand and by which you are saved. So the good news I'm giving you, this is what's saving you. This is your salvation. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. So it's not something I'm making up, but I received it first from Jesus Christ on the road to, to Damascus. And then I went to the apostles who were witnesses and I received from them the teachings and the sayings of Christ. So which I received, how Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried and that he rose again on the third day according to the scriptures. What scriptures? The Old Testament. The Old Testament prophets who talked about this is what's going to happen to the Messiah. He will die. He will be buried. And on the third day, he will rise again. This was all in the Old Testament, prophesied by the prophets. And St. Paul is re referring to these when he's preaching his gospel. And that after Christ rose, he was seen by Seth, Cephas, Peter, and then by the twelve. So... He died, he was buried, he rose, and now there are witnesses to this resurrection. After that, he was seen by about 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain up to this present time, but some have fallen asleep, some have died. So while I'm preaching this, understand that there's a lot of witnesses who saw Jesus Christ, who are still alive, and who can verify what I am saying to you. Now, this is important because, and then after that, he was seen by James, the brother of the Lord, who himself was martyred in 63 AD, and then by all the apostles. So what he's saying here, there's a lot of witnesses to this event. And this is the central event of the whole good news. Now, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how... Some How say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? Understand that even in this time, the time of the apostles, people were questioning the resurrection. Even in our time now, of course, there's a lot of uh, people who, who question the resurrection, say it didn't happen. Even in Paul's time, that happened. So he says, but if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. So if you don't believe in the resurrection of the dead, Christ is not risen. If he's not risen, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. You see what the resurrection is the central act of this whole good news. So if there's no resurrection, then your faith is in vain. You, you, you can have, there's nothing to believe in. And more than, more so than that, we're even found to be false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up. So you're saying there's no resurrection. You're saying Christ didn't uh, rise from the dead. Then we're preaching a false gospel to you. And if Christ not be raised, your faith is vain and ye are still in your sins. So you see that the resurrection of Christ is the central part of the good news. Okay, that's what Paul is saying here. 
So from these words, it follows that the central event that lay the foundation of Christian preaching was Christ's resurrection. And the main evidence of this event consisted in the many appearances of the risen Christ to the various groups of apostles. Without the witnesses, we have no verification that he rose from the dead. Now that we have that verification, we understand that this is what it's all about. This is what the good news is all about. Christ died for people's sins, was buried, and rose on the third day. These are the three fundamental truths upon which, as Paul says, the gospel rests. And if you recognize these words, it's because they're almost word for word in the Nicene Creed that we recite every divine liturgy. And that's why we recite that the divine liturgy, uh, that creed in the divine liturgy, because we recite the truth and we sear that into our memories, okay? So that the next generation will hear this and know that this is the truth and that's what we believe. It's the fact of God's entrance into history, into history, his appearance to people, in the person of Jesus Christ that forms the beginnings of Christianity and not any particular moral or social teaching. We understand that what Christ taught as far as moral teaching and social teaching, those were fine, those are great, but those are not central to the Christian message. The person of Jesus, his life, death, and resurrection are primary. All the rest is secondary. Okay, So that's why in setting forth this version of the gospel that we just heard from the Corinthians that the apostles preached, Paul does not have a single word to say on Christ's teachings or his sayings. Paul doesn't recite to them the Sermon on the Mount. He doesn't recite to them the miracles of Christ. He only recites his birth, his death, burial, and resurrection. And he does not say, if there's no collection of Jesus' sayings, your faith is in vain. He's saying, if there's no resurrection, your faith is in vain. So that's the take-home message today. Apart from everything else we've said with the Gospels, which are very important, which we want to learn, which we want to understand, but we have to understand that the central thing is the resurrection of Christ by which we are saved. So, any questions, any comments? Yes. Uh, traditionally, the sun rises in the east and Christ is the sun, S-U-N, of righteousness. And so he rises in the east. So we face the east because we face the rising Christ. <clears throat> yes, Marion. How is iconographic description? Um, I think, and I, I may be wrong, I think there were witnesses to Paul's physical presence who may have passed down orally what he looked like to uh, people who were iconographers at some point in time. Now, St. Luke was an iconographer himself, and he's reputed to have written the first icon of the Theotokos in Christ which we actually see on the left side of the holy doors with uh, Theotokos holding Christ in her arms. So there were witnesses to all of these. Yeah, yeah. In fact, there are icons of, of Luke writing the icon of Theotokos. Yeah, Rebecca. And you hear the woman 
that will really find the text. You might be right. Uh, yeah, you're absolutely right. They they had the sarcophagus and they had the the uh, physical imprints. Of those. Oh yes. That's correct. Yes, Sam. In the early church, what did they read during the church before the before the Bible before the gospel was written? Good question. And that is um, most of the time they would recite the words of the Eucharist. Take, eat, this is my body, take this, my... They would, they would start with Old Testament, actually, prayers. Some of the Psalms, some of the uh, early uh, prayers of the uh, Jewish tradition. Once the epistles of St. Paul were written, they were actually then started to be read in the church. And then when the gospels were uh, written and distributed, they then started to become read in the churches. And then eventually by around the fourth century, this uh, the liturgy of St. Basil the Great, well, I, let me back up. St. James, the brother of the Lord, actually wrote the first divine liturgy which was practiced in Jerusalem. And then St. Basil the Great and St. John Chrysostom wrote their liturgies, which we celebrate in our churches uh, around the fourth century in Constantinople. And then that in Antioch was also uh, there as well. And the church in Alexandria also uh, had the liturgy of St. Mark which then became their standard liturgy. Anything else? All right, next week, we're gonna actually start looking at each gospel individually. We'll delve into those, uh, each one, and try to elucidate what they tell us about uh, the life and teachings of Christ. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for being here. We'll see you next Sunday, God willing.